All right, welcome everyone. Thanks so much uh, for being here today for the official launch of the Atlantic OER repository. Before we get started, um, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. I myself am calling in from Jibuktuk or Halifax, which is located in Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral um, and unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We are all treaty people, and it is treaties like the Treaty of Peace and Friendship that allow us to be calling in from our respective provinces today. I am incredibly excited um, to be here at today's launch event to be chatting about Atlantic OER and what it means for our region camera as well as their microphones. Um, this is to help with bandwidth as we know that folks are calling from all over the Atlantic region and one thing the Atlantic region unfortunately is not known for is excellent internet. Um, so in advance please and thank you please be mindful of that um, and with that I would love to be able to introduce you to today's event. Um, so I know this is a project that we've been working on for quite some time um, for some context, I have been involved in student advocacy for three or four years at this point, and open educational resources were actually one of the first policies that I, were, I was introduced to. Um, this had to do, of course, with what was going on in British Columbia, as well as what was going on in Ontario. And I remember thinking to myself, is this something that we will ever be able to accomplish on the East Coast? Um, so I know for many of us today is incredibly exciting to see the launch of Atlantic OER and what that means for um, librarian staff, educators, students, you know, really every stakeholder in the campus environment. Um, so we're very pleased to offer a program today that hopefully will touch on many of those things. First and foremost, we are going to hear from Cynthia Holt, who is the executive director of CALL. Cynthia, of course, in her capacity, has been leading the working groups um, that have been working to create this. Excuse me, sorry. I'm just asking that everybody turn off their mic as well as their uh, camera, please and thank you, apologies. Um, so Cynthia, again, executive director, she's really been leading the charge and she's going to be giving us a high level overview of the project and what you need to know. Uh, next, we are going to hear from Anne Smith, who is going to be chatting about the grants program and how educators can apply in order to develop their own Atlantic OERs. Um, then we are going to be hearing from Samantha Graham. Samantha is the chair of Students Nova Scotia, um, as well as a committee member, and she's going to be chatting about the value of OER for students. Uh, then we will be hearing from Jason Loxton, who is a faculty member, who's going to be chatting again about the benefits, but from that faculty perspective, um, particularly coming from Cape Breton University, which has really taken on this project and spearheaded its success. Then we're going to hear from Leanne Stevens, who's going to be chatting about the benefits of open textbook adaptation and is going to be giving us a presentation about that. Lastly, we will be hearing Closing remarks from my counterpart, Wasima Juman from the New Brunswick Student Alliance. Um, and then we will have time for a Q&A at the end. Um, just as a reminder for folks who are coming in, um, we are asking that everybody keep their video off as well as their microphones in order to help with bandwidth. And this meeting is being recorded. Um, with that, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Cynthia Holt, who is going to be giving our introduction of Atlantic OER. So off to Thank you. Thank you very much, Clancy. And welcome, everybody, on behalf of the Council of Atlantic University Libraries. Uh, and thank you, Clancy, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the official launch of the Atlantic OER repository and service. Um, we uh, at Call are very excited for this new this new service that uh, we are launching today. It's been a long time coming. Um, Call itself is has uh, 19 universities and colleges among its membership, so we've had a lot of interaction and involvement from across the whole region, which is a fantastic endeavor for us all. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here uh, so that we could get going here. 
And one moment. So I'm proud to say that I've been part of the Atlantic OER initiative since it was just a kernel of an idea about five years ago. It's taken five years for us to get this far, uh, but I'm very happy today to say we are launching. Um, it was developed through the tireless commitment of many volunteers, and I'm going to uh, give you a list of them at the end, but those volunteers came from across all of our 19 uh, member institutions. Uh, we started, and I'll just give you a quick overview. We started back mm -hmm. in 2017, five years ago, with a, a survey where we focused on learning more about uh, the awareness and views of faculty in the region around okay, I'm getting resources. Um, and then in 2018, we had a group that took up from that survey result and, and started to look at what would be the optimal ways to uh, introduce open textbooks and open educational resources in the region uh, and develop an optimal service. And that's where we come to our current working group, uh, which took that roadmap developed by the previous working group and uh, took it forward to create, uh, develop and implement the model we are launching today. So I want to thank everybody uh, in those three working groups uh, for all of your hard work and tireless effort. Uh, so what is the Atlantic EEL OER ecosystem? Uh, so we actually have four components currently in the program or in the Atlantic EOR, uh, excuse me, OER uh, grouping. We have our Pressbooks digital publishing platform, and that's the platform where our open textbooks or ancillary materials are being created. Um, we also have uh, developing grants, which Anne uh, Smith is going to talk about later in this uh, in this webinar. Uh, we have peer review honoraria, which is uh, basically introducing the concept of scholarly peer review, just as we have with scholarly journals. And then lastly, we have the OER toolkit, which is basically all the resources that support the creation and adaptation process um, and all the parts that go with that. So I'm going to actually switch us over from here and take us over to the actual public presence of Atlantic OER. So if you haven't seen it already, this is the Atlantic OER website. Um, thank you very much to Kim Mears for all her Tyler's work in getting this up and going for us uh, so that we could launch on time with a fantastic website. Uh, one thing to note is up on the right corner, it is bilingual. We've made sure we have members uh, from the Anglophone and Francophone communities. So we want to make sure that we uh, ensure bilingualism in uh, everything that we're doing around this project. So uh, you can switch easily to uh, English or French. We also uh, have a ticker at the bottom that uh, is updated monthly to give you an idea of how many books are being created how many learners are being impacted, and how much savings those learners are, are, are having from the adoption by educators in uh, OER textbooks or open textbooks or OER materials. Um, that is a, a low number right now. We are going to be updating that soon because as we launch more books, but uh, just to give you an update, uh, that will update every time you come to the website. So you'll have a, a, a current view of what, we, uh, what those numbers are. Now there's three different parts to our website. Uh, we have the create section, which is basically where you would want to go if you wanted to start the creation process as an educator to uh, either create or adapt an open textbook. And I'll show you where that takes you. Uh, we do have the, how do I get grants to, to support my creation process? And Anne will be speaking to that later. And then you can also search to see what other resources have been created in the open environment by your fellow educators in the region. Um, so we're going to go to this uh, read more, which is the create. And what it does is it takes you to our Pressbooks platform. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with Pressbooks, it uh, is a platform that uh, basically allows you to create digital text based materials like textbooks, ancillary materials, those things. Um, so it's based on WordPress. So if anybody's used WordPress, it'll be a very similar experience. Um, the important part to note is that if you want to uh, get started on the Pressbooks platform, you have to click on this button and that will request that an account be created. Once you've created the account, you'll come into this environment here where you can see we have a textbook that's multiple chapters long, and this is our test book. We've created a sandbox where you can 
try things out and experiment with the different features of Pressbooks to create, to see what things might, how things might work or to test things before you try them in your own book. Um, so that's what this one is. Uh, and this is what it looks like in Pressbooks, but when you actually go to the open web, this is what you'll come to. This is what users of your textbooks will see. Usually they'll have a really, you'll have a really nice cover picture, um, but you'll see that it gives you the text, the, the name of the book, who it's by, um, and then it gives you an option to read the book. And if you do that, it'll take you into the book, and then you can drop down your table of contents and look at different chapters, and you can start reading the book. Um, so this one's by Jasmine Hoover, who has been trying out some things uh, in the Pressbooks platform to see how they work, different interactive uh, types of activities, tables, just to get a feel for a look and feel for how it would work if she went and did this in her own in her own book. Um, so the nice thing is on this platform, um, we have around 19 books in process right now. Um, we have uh, Physical Geology, which uh, is actually a book that Jason Loxton is using in his course, and he's going to talk about that later. Uh, but you'll see he's adapted it from an existing book. So that's the nice thing about OER. You, you don't have to create books from scratch. And I know that's always been sort of a daunting aspect to OER, the idea that, oh, no, I have to, I have, I'm going to need a lot of time to create a textbook from scratch. Well, there's tons of open textbooks out there that, that are already developed in your subject areas and you could just start with one of those or more than one of those um, to either adapt them for your own course needs and uh, customize them as you want or you can take several books and take parts of each book to create your own custom book. Um, so that's the beauty of the OER experience in that you can um, customize the book to your, your course and your needs uh, without having to create everything from scratch. So as you'll see here, this one that uh, that Jason has created, I'm just going to do a quick looking because I was looking at it earlier, and he has some interesting things in here. Uh, let's go to metamorphic and the types of metamorphics. Um, so you can see he has a whole bunch of content in here, and he has some nice uh, embedding of uh, visuals, and he can put interactive exercises. So you can see there's a whole bunch of uh, things you can do in an OB open uh, educational environment. Um, so I just want to give you a little overview. Now, Jason's is a book that was adapted from an existing book, but we also have examples of books that were... Uh, this particular one was actually a book that used to be published by a commercial textbook. Um, producer, and we uh, went through a process of contacting the original authors to ask their permission to make it available in the open environment to ever, anybody. Uh, and they very uh, graciously agreed to that. So this book is actually being uh, used and developed and, and adapted by a professor uh, for her course on communication training and development. Um, so those are some of the materials that you could create on this. And it's not just limited to textbooks. You can do any types of ancillary materials. Um, but the one thing, let's go back here. Um, the question is, so right now we're focused on uh, open textbooks, but what we really want to get to is the idea of open learning materials of all different types. And that's what we're trying to uh, move towards. Right now we are, we're getting up what we can get up. It's funded fully by um, member fees from the, uh, the Council of Atlantic University Libraries uh, budgets. So this is this is funded by call everything that you're seeing today um, but we would love to expand this service so that we can uh, accommodate more than just textbooks or, or ancillary materials we would like to see streaming media simulations lab experience audio recordings all types of learning materials for across all different lit disciplines uh, we would also like to see dedicated staffing right now we have a lot of volunteers putting in uh, a lot of hours to uh, with through dedication to to actually uh, keep this moving and keep it running uh, and make it available to everybody in the region. But we would love to see some dedicated staffing to us uh, and centralized staffing to support not just our the user community or the creators, but those who are actually on each of the institutional campuses supporting their creators. Uh, we'd also like to see a sustainable funding model. As I said, uh, right now, Call is actually paying um, for uh, 
everything to do with the repository right now, but we would love to see some sort of a sustainable funding model um, regionally based. So for uh, coming from the region um, that would cover things like infrastructure, staffing, development grants and the peer review process, which you're probably you're going to hear about a little bit further. Um, so really the future we see is a much bigger feature. Right now, we're doing some great things. We've got the Atlantic OER platform. We've launched the grants program. We're going to be launching an OER toolkit to support uh, creators in the process. And peer review, we're going to be introducing a peer review model to make sure that the, the, the materials being uh, created are of a, a, the appropriate quality, just as we do with a, a peer review process on scholarly materials. Uh, but we'd like to see it grow and develop and expand in the future. So uh, lastly, as everybody knows, um, things don't happen in a vacuum. Um, I want to express my sincere and he heartfelt thanks to all of these volunteers who have put so many hours in bringing this initiative to fruition. Uh, these are a lot of people who put in a lot of hours across these five years to bring this, uh, the, the Atlantic OER we know and see today uh, to where it is. Uh, it really, truly takes a village to create an OER repository. Um, so thank you. Um, if you have any questions, we will be answering questions at the end. But otherwise, uh, I thank you very much. And I'm going to turn things back over to Clancy. Great job, Cynthia. It is a big project and it does take a village. So being able to summarize that in 10 minutes is not the easiest thing to do. But thank you so much for giving us that overview and for your leadership on this project. Um, now to quickly shift into a topic I'm sure many of you are interested in. We have Ann Smith, um, who's going to be chatting a bit about the grants project. Um, we did have a webinar on the grants earlier, um, but she's going to give us a quick synopsis of that uh, so that you folks know what's going on. So Ann, over to you. Hi, lovely to talk to you all. I'm going to share my screen and quickly whip through Let's see. OK, so probably the most important thing I'm going to mention before I go any further is the web address. And everything I talk about today is available on our magnificent website, which uh, Cynthia showed you around just a little earlier. The big piece of news, of course, is we have five OER grants, each of 2000, and they are going to be awarded each year. And we have some this year. The deadline is March the 1st. So you all have time to apply right now. So what are the objectives of the program? We want to support the creation of the adaptation of open textbooks and the ancillary materials, the learning materials that Cynthia mentioned earlier. So we want to create a variety of OERs for use in credit bearing courses. We'd also like to um, establish supportive events for the development of this content. So if you need funding for sprints, which is an event where you create or adapt an OER, these are all eligible. And we're aiming to distribute funds to a wide range of student learners across the disciplines. So Interdisciplinary is great, a single subject is great. To cut to the chase, who can apply for these grants? Well, we welcome single applications joint between institutions, um, department, teaching and learning centres, libraries, it doesn't matter. All you have to be is an educator in this uh, call institution and at least one applicant must be um, capable of assigning readings for the credit bearing course for which the OER is intended. The one member must be employed by a call institution. So everybody could be or just one or two. And 
the OER must be aimed at a credit bearing OER within Coll. So this is the big question, I think. This is the one where we, we get the most questions. What is eligible for funding? Well, funding for those learning materials, as we've mentioned, you know, software, um, images, things like that. Expertise, perhaps, of a particular person who isn't employed or available at your institution or institutions. Um, student assistance. You could hire a student assistant to work directly on the OER or to help. Or what is also eligible is release time. So you could perhaps apply for funding to get some release for yourself to create or adapt OERs. How are the grants evaluated? Well, number one, when you apply, we make it really simple. It's not meant to be an onerous task. All the forms are available from the website. There are four of them and they are drop down. Most of them are drop down that are templates. So, for example, we ask for budgets or a timeline and we're looking for major items or in the timeline, major decision points or major events. Again, all available from that website. We have um, a separate form for sprints as well. The way we evaluate the grants, it's single blind peer review. Cynthia will know your identity, but the committee won't. And there's a committee of six people who will be looking for things like potential impact on the student experience open licenses and I am going to qualify that we're saying that they must be as open as possible because of course there are protocols surrounding cultural protocols surrounding traditional indigenous knowledge as an example so we might be looking for innovative and open pedagogy cost savings for students and a commitment to accessibility so for example it must be um, viewable by screen readers we're also looking for a commitment to sustainability. And I think we've had a number of questions about this. This might be as simple as a commitment to using your materials in future courses, in future years, or it might be how you plan to keep it up to date or you know, your mechanism for keeping it up to date, which might just mean editing, revisiting. It doesn't have to be anything terribly sophisticated. So, I shall release my screen. I can see in the chat as well, the definition of educator is very broad. It, it, we are not restricting, we are not narrowing it down any further than that. The only thing we're adding there is that a member of the team must be able to assign readings to a credit bearing course. And that doesn't have to mean everybody on the team or your double application or your single application. So we're keeping it quite simple. Yes, please check out the web page. I'm going to stop talking now because I have introduced the grants and I'd like to leave it to questions now at this point. I imagine people are focused on something. But thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you to everyone who is putting questions in the chat. As a reminder, we're going to do a Q&A at the end, um, so perhaps hold on to those juicy questions until we get to that point. Uh, next, we're going to move to Samantha Graham. Samantha is a vice president at the St. Mary's University Student Association, as well as chair of Students Nova Scotia, and she's going to chat a little bit about the importance of OER from the student perspective. So over to you, Sam. Wonderful. Thanks, Clancy. Um, so hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Like Clancy mentioned, I'm the chair of Students Nova Scotia, as well as the vice president external with the St. Mary's University Student Association. But first and foremost, I'm a fourth year economics student, and I'm going to be talking today about how OERs benefit students and how the Atlantic OER is going to make education more accessible for myself and my fellow peers. So we do know that textbooks after tuition are one of the highest costs that students are paying for their education. In some places, we know students are telling us they're paying over $500 per book and over the average four-year degree. That cost really adds up. 
And due to that high cost, a lot of students aren't buying the textbooks, not because they don't want to be successful in the courses, but because that cost on top of paying for school and rent and all of the other expenses that comes with post-secondary, it's just too much. And because of that, a lot of these students are put at a disadvantage. And as we know, that can impact some students more than others. Additionally, in a lot of instances, when students do buy the textbook, the information is already outdated and doesn't coincide with their existing course materials, which is something that can be mitigated with open educational resources. Something that I think has been an opportunity during COVID-19, which there are not a lot of, so we need to celebrate the wins that we get, has been since that a lot of campuses are closed, faculty and staff are having to get creative and find articles online or more open sharing content with students, and that's exactly what Atlantic OER is trying to do. Um, so having the ability to freely access the content for a course means that there's no accessibility barriers for students. Professors can tailor the materials exactly to their course, which increases student engage engagement in a lot of circumstances. And because faculty can keep their information more up to date more easily, students are participating actively in their respective industry, so they're prepared when they go out into the market after they graduate. Um, in a lot of instances, we hear that professors are saying students are still buying the textbook. This isn't an issue for them, but we know that students are not buying them when it's a high cost. And any of our librarians can tell us that in the weeks before midterms or finals, the 30 students in a class are all trying to get that one copy of the textbooks within the library, and that puts them at a dis disadvantage. So something that Clancy mentioned earlier on is that students in Nova Scotia and our friends at the NBSA and UPEI, we've been advocating all year for OERs. Um, and although OERs are something that's been top of mind for student groups for a few years now, again, like Clancy mentioned, the recommendation really gained some teeth when we were able to discuss the Call Pilot Repository and now Atlantic OER. So we're still continuing to advocate for respective provincial funding in addition to the call funding. Um, and we were able to have our student campaign, which is something that I really wanted to highlight in this presentation when we're talking about how OERs can impact students in a really good way. We had our student campaign where we were able to educate students about open educational resources and gain some testimony. And a lot of the testimony from students was that sometimes they don't buy the textbooks because they're too expensive or they have other things, but some of the more impactful testimonies that we received from students were about making the decision between buying groceries that week or buying their textbooks in the first few weeks of campus. And that can that's really impactful and something that shouldn't be happening for our students. They're coming to university, they're coming to college because they're inspired, they're passionate, and having to decide between eating and buying their textbooks is really not something we want to be happening. So that's why the benefits of OERs are enormous for in-class engagement um, and for enrollment, but it's also coming down to the cost and how the free accessible textbooks are eliminating those barriers for a lot of our students. So I'll keep it brief because I know that as students we see free textbooks and that's really helpful for us, but I wanted to highlight some of the other barriers that some of these traditional textbooks are having. And I'll throw it back to Clancy. Thank you so much, Sam. That was very eloquently said. Um, I know that I've certainly been in a position before where the cost of textbooks has meant that I didn't buy the textbook and then I'm scrambling at midterm season trying to figure things out. Um, and, you know, that's the real life impact of a project like this. And that's why, you know, we're so proud to stand behind this. Um, speaking a bit to that educator lens, and as mentioned, educator is a broad term in our definition. Um, I'm going to allow Jason Loxton to kind of chat about his perspective. Of course, Cynthia highlighted one of the resources that he was using, um, but very excited to hear about the educator perspective. Um, so Jason if you would like to join us. Yeah, absolutely. Are you able to hear me all right on the uh, microphone there? Yep. Okay, so I'm just going to really quickly go through. Now, all the communications uh, science suggests that anecdote is what's going to be emotionally convincing to you guys, but in theory, you're academics, and so you don't care about anecdotes, you want data. And I actually have data. I've been collecting data with... Uh, uh, ethics approval on a number of these issues. And so I just want to take a second just to really quickly show you, and I'm going to zip through because uh, my expectation is that you're going to ask some more questions later on. But this is all available if, if you guys want to take a look uh, later on. Um, so this is a, a survey I, I did of CBU faculty uh, asking them about uh, why they ask, why they choose certain textbooks. And you can see the biggest thing here, match between textbook content and uh, course content. That's the single biggest reasons why faculty are choosing the textbook they choose. I also asked them, why do they think they're, uh, what the most important thing they think is for their students? 
And not surprisingly, it's a totally different category. So there's this major disconnect. So we actually collected data on our students uh, over two years, both before and after the introduction of, a, uh, of an open textbook in our classes. And at CBU, in our particular uh, program, which is geology, um, over, over three quarters of our students are international students. That's worth noting. We asked them for textbooks in general, uh, or in general, what the resources that most helped them understand the class were. 65% said that textbooks were very important or extremely important. And you notice that except labs, it's actually the second largest category of extremely important. We then asked them how often they're actually not buying textbooks. And almost two thirds said that at least sometimes they don't buy textbooks because of, uh, of the cost. And interestingly, if you look at the ones who very often do it, international students were almost four times as likely as domestic students to very often not buy textbooks because of, uh, of cost. We asked them why they weren't doing it, and, uh, and it wasn't because they knew they wouldn't read it. It wasn't because they didn't think it was necessary to do well. Not at all. It was simply cost. That was the number one reason why they were not buying the textbook. Uh, so we asked them, OK, look, this is the year before we introduced it. Would you use an international, would you use an open textbook if we gave it to you? 85% said they'd be more likely to read it. And that, <laughs> that was borne out in the, uh, in the after surveys of, of actual practice. So then we asked them when we actually gave it to them after the year of using it. And you saw some of the images of the quality of the textbook we were using. We're lucky enough to have a really high quality textbook already available to us. 97% said that it was at least as good uh, or better than the commercial textbooks they were looking at. Uh, we asked them, and that's in all these different categories, 89% said they wished that, uh, or they, they uh, re rejected the idea that they would have preferred a, a traditional one uh, as, a, as opposed to that one, et cetera. So going back, one final thing. So I, I, we, can, we can unpack this data if you want later on. Uh, you know, 79% agree that they wish more of their classes would use open textbooks, et cetera. So I've got tons of data on this. The bottom line is that uh, students aren't buying it. They, their self-perception is that it's hurting them because they're not buying textbooks because of the cost. And when, at least in our iteration where we gave them one, they not only, they not only were okay with it, they actually preferred it over the, uh, the commercial versions that they had in their other classes. Anyways, I, I wanna just go back to this, this, that, that disconnect, which is seemingly you know, between faculty and, uh, and students. So students, obviously their prerogative is, uh, is, is cost. I mean, that's a major issue and it's, it doesn't directly affect us as faculty. I mean, it does because we're you know, empathetic people, but it's, it's, we're not putting the money out. What we're really, really concerned about is that is that connection between course content. If this is supposed to reinforce content, then it obviously has to match. And this is really where OER comes in, because we can look and we can find a textbook that best matches our, our material. But what better matches our material? The one that we've actually augmented to make it match. I can cut chapters out that have no relevancy. I can add material in. I can change the, the examples specific to what I'm teaching. So I want to show you one more quick thing before I, I close here in my last 45 seconds, which is uh, we asked them, if a textbook had more Nova Scotia content in, would you be more likely to uh, read it? 56% said yes. And bear in mind, these are international students. These are not Nova Scotian students, right? Not yet. We hope they will. Hope they're sticking around. And then we asked them, if you're an international student, what if there was more examples from your home country? 71% said yes, they'd be more likely. And it really is as simple with an OER textbook. It's going in, you know, cutting out the image of something or altering the text and just throwing in a local example and you get that, that pickup. One final bit of data, my last 10 seconds. This is from a new survey I just did. This isn't a textbook. This is on virtual field trips I was running. And I gave them the choice, would you rather the virtual field trips be about Cape Breton or would you rather they be about the Grand Canyon? Uh, or other international localities. And 75% said they wanted local content. And again, we can make that local content happen with OER. It's as simple as a few mouse clicks and a, uh, a few uh, keyboard clicks. All right, back to whoever is next. Thank you so much, um, Jason. First of all, what great data. And thank you so much for taking an interest and in being able to really demonstrate through the hard numbers that this is what students want. Um, this is what students need. But also, isn't this such a great way to bridge that gap for educators, like you say, who are looking for a way to match what they want to teach with the actual resources they have to teach it. As an aside, also as a Cape Bretoner, 
I would love to go on any sort of field trip to Cape Breton, whether virtual or not. Um, so I'm jealous of your students in, in many respects there. Um, they're also very lucky to have an educator like yourself who's this passionate about equity. Just um, really quickly, Clancy, go uh, in terms of OER, all those virtual field trips are actually available on social media for anyone to take. And I'll throw links down in the, uh, in the uh, chat window. Sounds good. You just got my next Friday night plans. Um, welcome, of course, to COVID-19 planning. Um, thanks so much, Jason. Really appreciate it. Uh, next, we're going to go to Leanne Stevens. Um, so Leanne's, again, going to give us a quick presentation, um, just again about the benefit of open textbook adaptation. So not to take too much time, but Leanne, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I was going to mention I've been following Jason on Twitter. And I've been watching uh, all of his uh, all of his virtual um, tours. They've been really exciting. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to talk kind of from the perspective of a um, a faculty member who has, like Jason, um, adopted and then adapted a textbook for our own use. Um, I am uh, involved with the Introduction to Psychology and Neuroscience program at Dow. It's a really large class, um, over a thousand students each term, um, and we're running uh, classes in all three terms, so fall, winter, and summer. So we hit a lot of students, um, and we know that there's a lot of costs associated um, kind of with all of those students. And so um, we have for a long time been wanting to move to open source. Um, we've never been comfortable with the cost of the textbooks in our, in our class. And we've also run up against um, every time we run the class, we want to change something. Uh, and when you're using the publisher textbooks, it makes that really difficult. So we, um, with the, uh, the OER grant that Dow offered for the first time last year, we were successful in getting that and we use that to create um, our own textbook or to adapt and then adopt that textbook. Um, one of the big focuses for our projects kind of across the board, um, we really like to partner with students to help us create that content. Um, and I just want to give a quick shout out to Molly Wells who helped illustrate a number of things for us. So she designed this um, custom cover for a textbook that I'm in love with. Each of those pictures corresponds with a specific chapter in the textbook, which is really neat. Um, so. We uh, kind of to give you an idea, just if you're looking at adopting something, the process that we went through, we started by searching for a base. So we wanted a strong foundation. Um, the 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 quality of what's out there right now has been just continuously improving. So we finally felt like there was enough there that we could work from. Um, and so we searched a number of different sources. We ended up finding something through OpenStax that really worked well for us in terms of the depth of that content and then knew that we would be modifying from there. The OER grant, as I mentioned, was really what allowed us to actually launch this project. So it was always a matter of not having enough time, not having enough resources, and kind of not knowing where to start. Um, but the OER grant essentially allowed me to hire two former students who knew the course really well, they knew the content really well, um, and I hired them for 60 hours each through a $3,000 grant. Um, and they basically went through, looked at all the content and all of the chapters of our Introduction to Psychology and Neuroscience course and tried to match it up to the textbook that we chose as our base. And then essentially what they did is they tried to identify where we might need to supplement content just to, to allow it to have good kind of match our, our course well enough in the beginning. And that kind of goes to, you know, we started off with relatively small expectations. Um, we knew that we'd be able to supplement any missing material. Uh, we had already formed um, uh, a series of videos that we call tricky topics. And our plan was essentially to um, embed those throughout the textbook and rely on them to kind of make up for any lacking um, information or content in the text, at least for our first run through. So that gave us the ability to do that. I will mention we didn't rely solely on um, video and audio. We had transcripts for all of those videos. And so we were able to embed those directly into the textbook. Um, one of the focuses that we had also was this idea of, of accessibility. And so we've got transcripts for all embedded videos. Um, and we also had Molly, who I mentioned before, uh, had a number of high contrast uh, images that we had custom drawn for us through a, a separate grant. 
Um, so our plan for that initial grant was really just to do that matching that we mentioned, and then we um, added the extra content that we needed through the Tricky Topic uh, video series. We recognized after we went through the, the 60 hours for each of those students, we had done a great job of matching, but there were a couple little things left that we wanted to make sure we highlighted or that we, we finalized before really rolling out in the fall. Um, and so we, we asked for a little bit more money and we were able to um, hire one of the same students back again for some more hours. And she really just finalized ensuring all those transcripts were in there, that we had nice anchors um, between where the, the videos were embedded and getting them to the transcripts. Um, she helped with some of the formatting, making sure our hyperlinks worked, all that kind of stuff was in there. Um, and just to highlight kind of what Sam was talking about in Clancy in terms of cost to students, as well as what Jason was saying in terms of that, you know, what is the main thing that is important for students? Um, our textbook was costing students $150 uh, to purchase. We've got a lot of students, and so we easily could see huge savings uh, right out of the gates by removing that cost. And so that was really our big focus. The exciting thing, as Jason mentioned, kind of this idea of being able to do what you want with your book, um, we immediately realized kind of all of these things that we could add and change within the book and we could really make it ours. And so we've started to uh, take on some really specific projects. One that we've been working on um, with a recent graduate is an inclusion project where we've started going through or we've actually made fairly significant progress going through the book, looking at not just language and, and um, looking at how we're using gendered language and different types of things like that, but also adding in additional content that highlights considerations, um, different types of things that historically we may have overlooked. Um, so we're adding some of that content in and we're also doing another project that we've just started Canadianizing the textbook, um, and that's as small as you know, making sure behavior is spelled with a U, uh, all the way through to um, we're working with a, another recent graduate of ours um, who is Micmac and is going to help us actually add um, lots of different sections on historical injustices, as well as highlighting important contributions um, from Indigenous communities across Canada to really elevate that level of Canadian content that we'll have there. Um, and again, kind of speaking to what Jason said, be able to tie it into Nova Scotia and Canada as a whole so that uh, students can really relate to that a little bit more. And then finally, um, with the, uh, the this ability of press books, allowing us to do some more interactive materials. That's my next big, big pet project is adding some different and interesting ways for students to interact with the textbook um, and kind of test their knowledge and, and content understanding before they move into assessments, formal assessments in the classroom. Um, so we've got lots of things on the go, lots of people to thank. It took a, a, a major uh, team to kind of pull all of these things together. And everyone in this list outside of uh, Jennifer Stamp, who's my colleague and helped work through this, and Kevin LeBlanc, who's the instructor and has been uh, kind enough to let me go through all of these things um, and try everything out in his course. Um, all of those people are students, which we're really proud of um, working with them as we've gone through. Um, so I'll leave it there and leave it to questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Leanne, and thank you so much for kind of demonstrating, you know, also a really great way of how do you go about finding, you know, a similar resource that you can build from. Cynthia is totally right in that we don't have to necessarily be building from scratch, and I think that makes the barriers to entry so much more manageable for folks, particularly if OER is something new. Um, so thank you so much for sharing those insights. We really appreciate it. Um, so before we head into our Q&A session, uh, which I will moderate, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Wasima Juman, who is the executive director of the New Brunswick Student Alliance. Um, so over to you, Wasima. Thank you, Clancy, and thank you for everyone joining us and who gave presentation. I'm just going to quickly wrap up what you all have already said and echo. Uh, but first, I would just like to acknowledge that I'm calling from the traditional and ceded territory of the Wallace Tukey, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq people, which is product in New Brunswick. Uh, but yeah, I guess uh, as everyone has already highlighted, we are all here for one purpose, uh, uh, and we just want equitable, accessible, inclusive, and quality education for all. And as you have seen through these amazing presentation. That's what Atlantic OER is, is 
It is accessible for educators and students. It is inclusive in that you're able to, to really manipulate what information you're giving to your students and really adapt and adopt and create your own material. As well as for online learning with now COVID-19, we have seen how this has really spearheaded uh, the Atlantic OER initiative in that, for instance, when we look at international students who are still enrolled in a post-secondary institution, in the province, but they are somewhere else and they are not able to attain the textbook. They are already at a disadvantage of that. So that really does bring in the inclusivity and really like trying to, to, to keep in mind that there are in, students that might not even be in the country to do that. And also like as Sam already highlighted, and I had this here, so that really does show the importance of it. I was a student who chose my groceries in, over a textbook and I bought textbook my first year as an international student, didn't know what was up. And for the rest of my degree, I didn't buy textbook. And I was always at 10 p.m. at the library trying to, to study the day before the uh, midterm. And my mental health took an impact on that. And it would have been so much easier for me to just have the, uh, the material available online. Um, again, equitable, it is cost effective. We have all discussed about this. This is free and open for everyone involved. And, and the quality, I think that's something that people have been really concerned about is uh, how does this uh, come into play when it comes to the quality from moving online? And um, I don't know if it's just for me too, too ambitious to say that, but I feel like the quality of education is going to improve with being able to really adapt your material to what you educators need their courses to be. And uh, as Leanne mentioned about uh, changing it and make, making it Canadianization and adding some things from an uh, indigenous background that are, uh, that traditional textbook usually cannot really like, cover because uh, there's so many aspects to be covering in a textbook. So I feel like with online and open education resources, you are able to do that. So um, very excited about the possibilities that uh, open education resources and the authentic OER representative system has for our students, but also for our educators into creating an accessible, inclusive, equitable and quality post-secondary education across the border. Um, and also you are all here because uh, you you are passionate about that and you are interested into that and, and you see the significance in that. And uh, even though now we are launching the event, I think like this is like we need to continue building the momentum because as Cynthia has said, uh, CAL is currently uh, funding the whole project, but it would be really nice to have our provincial government and other stakeholders really see the value into that and investing in that to uh, to allow it to continue in the future rather than just being a pilot uh, for a couple of years and then kind of dying away. So we really encourage you to, to, to adapt to this and to, to really talk about it with your colleagues or in anyone and really break the, I guess, like the stigma that Oh yeah, is this daunting thing? But rather, it's very exciting. Uh, and as someone who just joined uh, on the working group over the summer, the amount of time of things I have learned about OER, and I'm so fascinated by it now that I'm like, it is not at all daunting. It is very, uh, very fun to play around, but also very inclusive. And you are really like the intersectional justice kind of deal uh, with it too. So I really uh, encourage everyone to keep talking about it and talk about it to your colleagues and to everyone. So uh, again, thank you very much to everyone who has worked on this for forever. I know Clancy has worked on it for two years. I, I know Cynthia has been really highly involved in this and everyone on the working group. It's been a pleasure to work on this and I cannot wait to see all the amazing things that come out of this project. Uh, again, thank you so much. I'll pass it back to Clancy. Wasima is pulling on my heartstrings in a way I didn't imagine at quarter to 3 p.m. Uh, thank you so much. And to clarify also to add, you know, in case you're curious why uh, an organization like Students Nova Scotia or the New Brunswick Student Alliance is supporting this, is both of our organizations have actually put it in our provincial budget asks uh, for you know, continued year over year funding for this project. We entirely agree, um, particularly looking at, you know, other models out West, whether it be in Ontario or British Columbia, that this is something that is such an important initiative and that our provincial government should really be taking a look at. Um, so just a heads up, that is something that we are certainly working on. That comes to the end of our formal presentation for the day. Um, I am sure because again, it's such a high level overview that folks may have questions. Um, so we're actually going to open it up to a Q&A. If you have questions, um, feel free 
to either put up your hand uh, or put them in the chat and I will call on you accordingly. Um, I will, however, probably defer uh, to Cynthia in terms of answering questions, um, but we're very happy to hear what folks may have to say. Also, we take compliments. I would like to say that it's questions, comments, concerns, compliments. If you have those as well, we're happy to hear them, uh, but we'll take the next 10 minutes to kind of address those concerns. And don't be shy. Well, if if I can speak. So um, hello again. I'm so happy to be here. You don't know my emotion is shared with all of you. And uh, for the last couple of months, and we need to recognize the amazing work that you all of you are putting on this resource and put it together and learning from the experience of uh, other universities doing and creating something that is uh, customized for our needs. Um, it is a resource that is also very important for students because the students here were claiming in different movement in different voices. So to have and receive and to have an opportunity to access different uh, free texts and open texts. And also it's an opportunity to connect with communities. So my I don't have any question, only compliments and saying thank you. And plus making a, a little bit of, a little bit kind of like advertising about um, publicity on the HTML5 and how we integrate those plugins into the book, creating interactive books. And it's going to be, it, it's amazing. So we have a, probably with some of you, we shared the, the last um, uh, workshop on how to integrate those plugins. Oh, it's, it's, it's one thing that is adding a, an active process to the reading, so then it's free, is open, is evolving, is, uh, is shared with the community, is inviting the students, and also is interactive. So congratulations, all of you. Well, that was amazing feedback. Very difficult to top, so thank you very much. Um, and thank you as well for bringing up integration. Yes, um, Atlantic OER does support integration of different plugins, uh, MathJax, HTML5, et cetera. Um, Cynthia, is there anything else that you'd like to add on that first before I go to the questions in the chat? Sure. Uh, first thing is uh, Juan, who just spoke, actually has two books being cre in the process of being created. He's actually working, having the students in his course work on creating the textbook for the students coming after them uh, in connection in under the guidance of an elder at UNB. So he's actually involving the students in the creation of the book very specifically in their course they're taking now. So it's a great learning experience for them to dive deep into the topic area. Uh, also wanted to mention that uh, we are having a, our next book launch uh, is going to be occurring during Open Education Week, the first week in March. Um, so stay tuned and we will be announcing um, information about that book launch in the very near future. And H5P, we are looking to hire a Young Canada Work student um, hopefully a Young Canada Works intern to actually help support faculty, uh, excuse me, educators in the, the using the H5P and embedding interactivity into their books and supporting them in the creation process. So uh, some institutions have uh, staff on uh, people on staff in the libraries or outside that will support uh, educators in the process uh, of creating open educational resources, but not every one of our member institutions has that support. So we're looking to try to bring in somebody to, to provide that centralized support. That's all I had. Great, we do have two other questions that I believe have been answered directly in the chat, but just to read them out. Uh, one was about who's sitting on the grant review committee um, and will that change? So the grant review committee will be a mixture faculty, staff, as well as students. Um, I'm not sure if we've gotten to the point yet about whether that will rotate, um, but certainly something to consider. Um, and the second question was whether or not the grants are available. They are available um, already, so feel free uh, to take a look on our website for the full details there. Okay. 
Any other question? Yes, the committee membership rotates. So thank you for that, Cynthia. We still have time for a few questions. If anybody has any, I'm just going to check for hands in the chat. A reminder also, so again, um, feel free to check out our website. We also have social media presence at Twitter, um, Atlantic OER. That's another great place to find uh, some of our information. We'll put it out for one potential more question. If not, we will wrap. Well, I just wanted, oh, one. Yes, thank you so much. And I just want to say, honestly, it's not often that you have uh, a presentation as comprehensive as this one where you get to the end and folks have no questions. So I'd like to thank um, everybody for their presentations and everybody for coming out today to really learn um, what's going on. It's, it's a pretty good testament to the strength of our presenters. Um, but again, thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for your interest in this project. Uh, we certainly ask if you know of any educators within your network or on your campus who would be interested, direct them to the website, let them know that the grants are available. Um, they are going to be available until March. Um, so definitely Definitely check them out, encourage folks to apply, and we really appreciate your time today. Take care, everyone.